today i am going to start a new chapter which will be focusing on compression member compression member means the member which are carrying the axial force generally this type of members is termed as compression member again compression member are named as like column strut boom stanchion in different type of uh, structure structures like in case of rcc building the vertical members which are carrying the load from beam or slab to the ground uh, that is called as column again if same type of member is used in the steel building then this is called as stanchion the compressive member in a roof truss or bracing is called strut and the principal compression member in a crane is called boom that means the same compression member is termed different way one is column or stanchion or strut or boom like this we used to generally term them now when we are going for design of a compression member we will see what are the mode of failure on that basis we have to design modes of failures means one is crushing failure another is buckling failure and another is mixed mode of crushing and buckling now what is crushing failure crushing failure means when a very short length compression member under compressive force is coming into picture that means when the length of the column is short suppose this is a column now force is there that means for this type of cases if we see the cross section it is like this so only the axial forces are coming into picture majorly that is why this failure will be because of only crushing crushing failure another is buckling failure buckling failure will come into picture when a very long length compression member are under compressive force such member has a critical load which causes elastic instability due to which the member fails so these are the basically two type of failure which occurs in column and another failure is the mixed mode of crushing and buckling this is the most common failure in column we used to see that is the above two failures in extreme cases means for all intermediate values of cylinder ratio the columns fails due to the combined effect of crushing and buckling most of the column fails due to this mixed mode that means when we are going to calculate the column strength we have to see what is the strength due to the crushing effect and what is the strength due to the buckling effect and most of the columns are going to fail because of these two modes one is buckling and other is crushing so when we are designing the column or compressive member we have to take care these two part that means when we are going to apply a load this will be means depending on their end condition this will buckle like this so if i see like this so it may buckle like this or it may buckle say like this so depending on their end condition so due to buckling one stress will develop and due to compressive one another stress will be developed so we have to check the uh, column we considering this two type of failure now effective length because effective length is important to consider the cylinderness ratio of the column or of the compressive member because when we are going to calculate the buckling force the force which is coming due to buckling we need to know the cylinderness ratio and accordingly the buckling forces will be developing now the effective length of a compression member is the length between the two adjacent points of zero moments that means if we have a say column like this and if moment is developing like this then the point of contraflexure will be here and here that means zero moment should be here and here so effective length will be this one whereas the total length means this will be the capital l will be the total length so this basically the effective length of a member depends upon the end condition that means what are the end condition whether it is fixed or hinged or free on that basis 
the moment will be developing in this column. So, accordingly the point of contrafracture will develop and accordingly we have to find out the effective length and calculation of effective length has been given in clause 5.2.2 of IS 819.84. Now, in clause 5.2.2 uh, the procedure has been given and it says that where accurate frame analysis is not done, the effective length in a given plane may determine by the procedure given in appendix C. So, in appendix C also the details has been given. So, in clause 5.2.2 what it is told that the accurate frame analysis if cannot be done then effective length cannot can be find out from the procedure which is given in the appendix C. However, the values in table 5.2 in the code are sufficient in most of the cases. That means, the procedure we can follow which is given in the appendix C or what we can do? We can find out the table which is given in IS 819.84, where for different in conditions the length of effective, effective length has been given and which is means most of the common cases has been given in this table. What is this? Say this is one case which has been given in the table 5.2. That is first is degree of end restraint of compression member means what is the end condition? Then recommended value of effective length which is given here and the symbol from which easily we can identify what type of fixed means what type of end conditions we are going to provide. Say in case of first case effectively held in positions if the ends are effectively held in positions and restraints against rotation at both end. What does it mean? That means effectively held and it position means here vertical displacement has been restrained also the rotation. That means these are fixed. So, in this case the effective length L e will be equal to 0.65 L. So, this has been given in the code which can be used readily. Another case may appear which is like this that is one hinge in one end and another end is fixed which is can be defined as effectively held in position at both ends and restrained against rotation at one end. That means, effectively held at position at both ends and restrained against rotation at one ends. Here ro against rotation it is restrained, but here it is not. That means, in one end it is hinged, another end it is fixed. So, in this case the effective length will be 0 0.8 L. Right? Now, another condition is effectively held in position at both ends, but not restrained against rotation in both the ends. That means, if it is hinged, if both the ends are hinged, then what will happen? The effective length will be the total length, the length between two support. Right? So, in this case effective length we are getting like this. You see this is the place where moment is becoming 0 and this is the place where moment is becoming 0. That is why this Le will be equal to L. That is why there is means the coefficient is 1. So, this is one condition. Again another condition can be considered like this that is effectively held in position and restrained against rotation at one end and at the other end restrained against rotation, but not held in position. What is the meaning? That means, here it is fixed, this side it is fixed, but this side against rotation it is restrained, but it is not restrained the displacement. So, in this case the effective length will be like this, means not like this, uh, effective length will be L is equal to 1.2 L. That means, the length will be 1.2 times the total length. This is another condition where it has told that 
effectively held in position and restrained against rotation at one end that means this one and at the other end partially restrained against rotation but not held in position partially restrained against rotation but not held in position in this case the effective length can be calculated from this formula that is l is equal to 1.5 l so another condition which can be occur also in industrial building that is like this this is called like this that effectively held in position at one end but not restrained against rotation and at the other end restrained against rotation but not held in position so in this case that means restraints against rotation but not held in position and here that not restraints against rotation but effectively held in position in this case the effective length will become 2l effective length will become 2l so all these conditions may arise in case of design of industrial structure so that is why the code has given the provision of keeping all this another option which is given here that effectively held in position and restraints against rotation at one end means restraints against rotation and position but not held in position nor restrained against rotation at the other end this is free so at the other end it is not restrained against rotation nor the position so in this case the length will be 2l right so like this the effective length for different cases can be calculated right now another codal provisions has been given in is code is 800 1984 in clause 5.5 which i am just going to read out because this is important and while designing the angle sections we have to find out the um, effective length accordingly so in clause 5.5.1 it is told for single angle struts what is that that single angle discontinuous struts connected by a single rivet or bolt may be designed for axial load only provided the compressive stress does not exceed 80% of the values given in table 5.1 i'll come details about table 5.1 later in which the effective length l of the struts shall be taken as center to center inter of intersection at each end and r is the minimum radius of gyration what is told okay other thing is in no case however shall the ratio of cylinderness ratio for such angle struts exceeds 180 what is it telling that means that lambda that is l by r should not be means should be less than or equal to 180 in any case this is one thing means it should not exceed 180 another thing is the effective length shall be taken as center to center of intersection at each end that means where the uh, rivet is given according to that we have to find out the effective length and another important thing which has been given here that the compressive stress does not exceed 80% of the values given in table 5.1 in table 5.1 allowable compressive stress for different steel and for different cylinder ratio so has been given now the compressive stress for single angle strut has to be reduced 80% of that means allowable stress whatever given in table 5.1 we have to reduced 80% of that to find out the working allowable stress in case of single angle struts right so this is also we have to remember that means sigma ac if i say the allowable compressive stress that will be 0.8 into sigma ac where sigma ac is been given say i am telling this is as sigma ac dash where sigma ac has been given in table 5.1 which is based on the uh, cylinderness ratio and the type of steel used in the section so 
the working allowable stress in strut in angle strut will be 0 0.8 into sigma c. This is the things which has been told in clause 5.5.1 a. Another thing is in b it is told that single angle discontinuous struts connected by a weld or by two or more rivets or bolts in line along the angle at each end may be designed for axial load only provided the compression stress does not exceed the values given in table 5.1 in which the effective length L shall be taken as 0.85 times the length of the strut. So, here what we will take that effective length will take 0 0.85 into 0.85 into L. L means the length of the strut and the sigma AC value will be simply which is given in the table 5.1 that value will be taken right. Now, this is center to center of intersection of at each end and R is the minimum radius of gyration. Always we have to consider R as R minimum. Radius of gyration will take the minimum radius of gyration under which the worst condition will develop. So, in this clause what we understood that one thing is for single angle discontinuous struts connected by a weld or by two or more rivets then we have to take effective length as L is equal to 0.85 L and the allowable compressive stress will be simply whatever it is given in table 5.1 and for single angle discontinuous struts connected by a single rivet or bolt in that case the allowable compressive stress will be 0.8 times of the allowable compressive stress given in the table 5.1 and L the length will be simply the length from cent mean center to center of intersection at each end and the sigma AC value has been given in the code in table 5.1 and always this has to be checked that means slenderness ratio in any case should not exceed 350 right. Another clausal provision has been given in 5.5.2 in case of double angle stress. Earlier in 5.5.1 we have seen in case of single angle. Here we will be seeing in case of double angle. Now, for double angle discontinuous struts back to back connected to both sides of the gusset or section by not less than two bolts or rivets in line along the angles at each end or by the equivalent in welding the load may be regarded as applied axially. The effective length L in the plane of end gusset shall be taken as between 0.7 and 0.75 times the distance between the intersections. So, effective length will be in between 0.7 to 0.85 times the distance between intersection depending on the degree of the restraint provided and in the plane perpendicular to that of the end gusset the effective length L shall be taken as equal to the distance between centers of intersections. So, in one direction this will be 0 0.7 to 0 0.85 times the distance between intersections and in perpendicular to that simply this will be L. The calculated average compressive stress shall not exceed the values obtained from table 5.1. So, whatever values have been given in table 5.1 it should not exceed that. For the ratio of cylinderness, cylinderness based on the appropriate radius of gyration, based on the appropriate radius of gyration. Okay. So, for double angle this provisions we have to keep in mind while going for design. Another thing is that double angle discontinuous struts back to back connected to one side of a gusset or section by a one or more bolts or rivets in each angle or by the equivalent in welding 
shall be designed as for single angles in accordance with clause 5.5.1 a right so as per the clause 5.5.1 a which is given here 5.5.1 a as per that we have to design means accordingly we will consider the effective length and the allowable permissible stress and for continuous member which is given in clause 5.5.3 that is single or double angle continuous struts such as those forming the flanges cords or ties of trusses or truss girders or the legs of towers shall be designed axially loaded compression members and the effective length shall be taken in accordance with the clause 5.2.4 so which as we have already told the what should be the effective length so accordingly we have to consider so these are some points which we have to remember when we are going for analysis and design of the compressive member now we are talking about effective length because we need to know the slenderness ratio so before going to calculate the strength of a compression member we need to know what is the radius of gyration and what is the slenderness ratio and accordingly we can find out other details like we know radius of gyration generally we can say as r is equal to root over i by a where i is the moment of inertia and a is the cross sectional area of the section right now so r x s i can make as root over i x x by a and r y y radius of gyration in y direction can be written as i y y by a and which one is the minimum that we have to consider for the calculation of the strength of the compression member so we will find out what is r x s value and what is r y y value or basically i x s value and i y y value and minimum of that we will be going to consider for the finding out the slenderness ratio and slenderness ratio we know slenderness ratio is nothing but l by r length by radius of gyration right and maximum slenderness ratio will be we can say l by r minimum and for maximum slenderness ratio you will get minimum strength as the slenderness ratio increase the strength is going to decrease why because suppose we if we have a compression member like this now if we increase this length what will happen the slenderness ratio is going to increase then the load carrying capacity is definitely going to decrease because of the slender effect because of the slenderness effect the load carrying capacity of the compression member is going to decrease that is why the we will consider lambda max maximum slenderness ratio, ratio of the section for calculation of the strength of the compression member or for design of the compression member right so for every section the values of radius of gyration about the principal axis are obtained so that the least values of radius of gyration are minimum may be obtained to find the maximum slenderness ratio lambda max so to find lambda max you have to find out the r minimum r minimum means i x x minimum means i minimum moment of inertia minimum right the slenderness ratio lambda of a compressive member is defined as the ratio of its effective length to the radius of gyration what we have told earlier effective length by radius of gyration so lambda max we have to calculate as l effective by r minimum when r is becoming minimum this will become maximum and maximum means stress will become means allowable stress will be becoming less minimum now in code is 81984 in clause 3.7 the value of maximum slenderness ratio is given which is given in table 3.1 of is 81984 the permissible value of slenderness ratio like when a member carrying a compressive loads resulting from dead loads and imposed load in that case the maximum slenderness ratio should become 180 that means lambda should not 
become more than 180 right. So, when when the member is carrying compressive loads resulting from dead load and imposed load ok. Another case is when a tension member in which a reversible or di of direct stress due to loads other than wind or seismic forces occurs. In that case also we have to consider that lambda maximum as 180 that means the cylinderness ratio has to be within the range of 180. I am repeating once again when it will be 180 that when a tension member in which a reversal of direct stress due to loads other than wind or seismic forces occurs that means because of maybe because of dead load live load imposed load and for those things if it occurs then also the cylinderness ratio will become 180. A member subjected to compression forces resulting from wind or earthquake forces provided the deformation of such member does not adversely affect the stress in any part of the structure. In those cases, we can consider the cylinderness ratio as maximum 250. So, for this case, the cylinderness ratio maximum will be 250. In case of compression flange of a beam, the cylinderness ratio limit is 300 and when a member normally acting as a tie in a roof truss or a bracing system, but subject to possible reverse of stress resulting from action of wind or earthquake not dead load or imposed load resulting from action of wind or earthquake in this case 350 and for dead load and live load this is given 180 and for this case this is 350 ok. If it is wind load or earthquake load in that case we can allow up to 350. So, these are the codal provisions has been given for limiting values of slenderness ratio. Now, as we told that compression member fails due to crushing and due to buckling either of crushing or buckling or both right. So, for buckling we know the Euler's theory to find out the critical load which can be given by this equation as critical load equal to pi square E i by L effective, where E i is the flexural rigidity and L effective is the effective length which depends upon the end condition. So, if we know the effective length of the compression member and the flexural rigidity, then I can find out the critical load P c. And similarly, I can find out also the critical stress as P c by A, because the load critical load by area will be equal to critical stress. So, if I divide this P c is nothing but pi square E i by L. So, this will become pi square E i by A into L effective right. Again I is defined as A into R square, I can be written as A R square ok, where R is the radius of gyration and A is the cross sectional area right. Now, if we make this we will get A A will get cancelled. So, it will become pi square E by L effective by R whole square, where L effective by R is nothing but the slenderness ratio and which can be named as lambda. So, we can make some simply pi square E by lambda square. So, critical stress due to buckling can be termed as pi square E by lambda square, which will be required for calculating the allowable stress in compression in the compression member. Right. Now, this theory whatever the Euler's theory is discussed that is based on the following assumptions which we should remember. One is the flexural rigidity E i is uniform that means, throughout the compression member the flexural rigidity will be uniform right. If the compression member is like this 
So, throughout its length the things are uniform. Another thing is the material is isotropic, these are one assumption. Another assumption is axis of column is perfectly straight if unloaded, that means when unloaded the axis of column is perfectly straight on this assumptions only the Euler's theory will work. Another assumption is the line of thrust coincide exactly with the unrestrained axis of the member, line of thrust coincide exactly with the unrestrained axis of member. Another assumption is the buckling value P is equal to P C is obtained for all degrees of flexion, buckling value can be find out where P C is the critical load, right. So, under this assumptions only I can write this equation that is critical stress is pi square e by lambda square and critical load is critical load is pi square e by e i by L. Critical load pi square e i by L effective and critical stress pi square e by lambda square can be written from this assumptions, right. Now, when we are going for design of different type of compressive member, we have to see what are the available compression members and which type of members we are going to use. In general, we used to use like this type of section, one is angle section is generally used for compression member. Angle section again it may be equal and it may be unequal, means longer leg and smaller leg will be there or equal section. Another is like pipe section, means circular. Okay. Another important section which we used to use in compression member is the I section. I section is very commonly used in case of compression member. Of course, in case of compression member with moment if we consider I section is mostly used. Again, we will see later that this I section, if this, this is the I section, again we may add some plate extra as per the requirement of the design. So, it may go on adding another plate. So, this will become a built up section means as per the requirement it may go on increasing. So, all this we will see later that how built up sections we use for the design of compression member we will see later. Now, column design formula. So, how we will design? What will be the formula through which we can find out the allowable compressive stress in a compression member? How do we make? Because most of the compression member fails in a mixed mode. Mixed mode means crushing failure and buckling failure. So, we have to take care both. One is due to crushing, another is due to buckling. So, this can be find out from different formula and merchant ranking formula is mostly used to find out the allowable compressive stress in a compression member. What is that? That merchant ranking formula is told that 1 by f to the power n is equal to 1 by f c c to the power n by plus 1 by f y to the power n. Where F C C is the critical stress due to buckling and F Y is the yield stress of the steel, right? And F is the allowable stress which is coming from these two stresses, means resultant stress, right? So, if we find out this resultant of this 1 by F to the power n, this will become like this and f to the power n will become finally this. That means, f y f c c whole to the power n by f y to the power n plus f c c to the power n. So, where f is nothing but the stress, resultant stress, the stress which will be developing in the con column or in compression member or you can say the stress which can be allowed in the member. Okay. 
So, from this I can find out f the stress resultant stress. Now, resultant stress will become f y into f c c by f y to the power n plus f c c to the power n whole to the power 1 by n. So, from this formula I can find out the value of f and then finally, with a factor of safety the formula can be rewritten as like this with a factor of safety because in case of design always we used to consider some sort of factor of safety. So, sigma a c the allowable compressive stress can be written as m into f c c into f y by f c c to the power n plus f y to the power n whole to the power 1 by n. So, sigma a c value can be find out from this equation right. Now, in I s code 800-1984, it has been recommended that the Marchand Rankine formula has been recommended with some modification that is the factor is considered as 0 0.6 right. So, the allowable stress sigma s c in a compressing member can be find out from this formula. So, allowable stress in compression member sigma s c is equal to 0 0.6 into f c c into f y by f c c to the power n plus f y to the power n whole to the power 1 by n. So, this is the allowable stress on a compressive member which is undergoes buckling and crushing means due to direct stress and due to buckling. Okay. So, the allowable stress can be find out from this formula where sigma c we are telling that permissible stress in axial compression in MPA and F y is the yield stress in steel and F c c as I told earlier that is elastic critical stress in compression which can be find from this equation pi square e by lambda square. So, elastic critical stress in compression can be find out from here and E is nothing but the modulus of elasticity of steel which can be written as 2 into 10 to the 5 MPa and N is a factor which is generally assumed as 1.4 right. So, with this parameters the sigma s c value has been calculated which is 0 0.6 into f c c into f y by f c c to the power n plus f y to the power n whole to the power 1 by n. So, in this way we can find out the sigma s c value where terms are I mean the different parameters are given. Okay. Now, with this formula we can find out the value of sigma s c or in other way also we can find out through the table 5.1 of I s 890.84 which is given on the basis of this formula right. So, either we can directly con calculate the allowable stress sigma s c from this formula or the sigma s c value can be find out from table 5.1 where the values have been given from this formula only okay. because this is a big formula. So, in place of calculating all this we can simply use table 5.1 and can find out the value of sigma s c right. So, in table 5.1 we will see that sigma s c for some values of Indian standard structural steel for a given value of lambda has been given. Okay. So, for lambda for lambda and for different steel the values have been given sigma s c values have been given here. Okay. If we see the table 5.1 in IS 800 is given that permissible stress sigma s c in MPA. Okay. Now, these are the value of lambda, lambda means the slenderness ratio for different slenderness ratio we can find out the value of sigma s c for different grade of steel. Say in case of 250 with a slenderness ratio of 80 
we can find out the value as 101 MPa, right. So, from table 5.1 directly we can find out the value of sigma AC for a value of means for a given value of lambda and Fy for a particular grade of steel and for a particular value of slenderness ratio the sigma AC value the allowable compressive stress in that member can be find out. And suppose for 75 means for lambda is equal to 75 slenderness ratio if it is 75 what will be the sigma AC value the allowable compressive stress value for yield steel of 250. How do we find out then that means that means for 80 it is 101 for 70 it is 112. So, we can find out the value from these two by the method of interpolation that means it will become for 75 it will simply become 112 plus 101 by 2 ok that means 106.5 ok. So, in this way we can find out that means the in between values can be find out by linear interpolation. This is not the whole table a big table has been given up to 180 this lambda value for lambda value it is given and for different grade like AP uh, 415 500 all grades of steel it has been given and as if we produce the whole table it will not be visible that is why a part of the table has been shown here right. Now, we can go for an example that how to find out the strength of a compression member. So, example told that a built up column shown in the figure below consists of 4 ISA 100 by 100 by 10 and has to carry 1000 kilonewton compressive load. If the steel conforms IS 226-1975 find out the maximum allowable effective length if all the four angles are elevated together B rivets are removed so that angles act independently. Right. So, let us see the orientation of the angles. So, these are placed like this. So, it has been divided like this angles are ISA hundred by hundred by ten 
right. So, these are one angle, this is another angle and this is another angle, right and all this is another angle, ok. So, for finding out the solution, what we see that from steel table we can find out i x x is equal to i y y is equal to 10 to the 4 millimeter to the 4. From steel table for I s a 100 by 100 by 10, the values has been given I x x as equal to I y y is equal to eta and a is equal to 19.03 millimeter square, c x x is equal to c y y is equal to 28.4 millimeter. These are the things which have been given. Now, let us come to the first case. First case means all the four angles are riveted together. If it happens like this, then what will happen? For first case, then I x will be basically I y which will be equal that will be 4 I x x plus area into C x x square, right. So, this will become 4 into I x x values are 177 10 to the 4 area is 1903 and cxx is the cg distance 28.4 okay so this we are going to get 1.32 into 10 to the power 7 millimeter to the power 4 and total area will become 4 into 1903 7612 that is why we can find out r as i by a this will become i is 1.32 in 10 to the 7 and area is 7612 this will become 41.67 right so we are getting the value of radius of gyration now we can find out what is the developed stress sigma sigma is p by a here p is given that is 1000 kilo newton right so 1000 into 10 cube by area area is given as 7612 so this is coming 131.4 mpa right so the developed stress this is developed developed stress is 131.4 mpa now from table 5.1 of the is code we can see that values are given like this for 132 this is 50 means if sigma is 132 the sigma ac value then radius of gyration is becoming 50 and this is 122 this is for 60 so from this i can find out the value of lambda for the stress which is given as 131.4 so, this will become 60 minus 50 by 132 minus 122 into 132 minus 131.4 plus 50. So, from this I can find out lambda value as 50.6. That means the developed stress 131.4 MPa, whatever we have found for that the lambda value has to become 50.6. In other sense we can say that if the radius of gyration become 50.6 then the allowable sigma AC can be taken as this value that 131.4. That means for lambda as 50.6 sigma AC value is becoming 131.4 right. Thus, we can find out 
length will become lambda into r. So, lambda is becoming 50.6 into r we have already 41.67. So, this is becoming 2109 millimeter that means 2.11 meter. So, we can say that effective length will become 2.11 meter to carry 1000 kilometer load. Okay. And now, if we go for second case that means, if angles are acting independently, then what will happen? In that case, R x x will become that is individual i by individual a that means, 177 into 10 to the 4 it was the individual i and a was 1903. So, this will become 30.5 like now developed stress will become sigma this will become 1000 kilometer it was and it has to be shared by 4 angle. So, 4 into 1903. So, this is becoming 131.4 MPa. Okay. So, this is the developed stress developed stress that is 131.4 MPa. That means, to develop this much stress, this much stress can be allowed if the lambda becomes 50.6 as we have calculated earlier. Here we have calculated 50.6 right. So, lambda will become 50.6 if we have to allow the stress as 131.4 MPa. So, this will become finally, sigma AC. Okay. So, sigma AC is becoming 131.4 MPa if the lambda becomes 50.6. So, lambda is basically we can calculate as L by R that means, L is equal to lambda into R. So, 50.6 into R was gi given as 30.5 which I we have calculated. So, this will become 1543.3 millimeter into 1.5 meter 54 meter. So, in this case effective length we are getting as 1.54 meter. So, what we are seeing here that if the angles are acting independently, if it is not connected, then effective length will become 1.54 to carry the load 1000 kilonewton. To carry a load of 1000 kilonewton, the length should not become more than 1.54 meter. Whereas, in case of acting together, the length can become 2.11 meter means for carrying 1000 kilonewton load the length of the member can become 2.11 meter maximum length to carry that 1000 kilonewton load when the sections are acting together that means connected by the rivet. So, that means, if it acts together, it can take more load okay? or if in other words, we can say to carry same load, the length can be increased if the sections are tied together. So, I think now it is clear how to find out the compressive load, allowable compressive load on a compression member. Now, next day we will discuss about the design of compression member means how to design. Here we have seen how to find out the strength of a compression member which is going to means be under direct compressive force as well as indirect that buckling force. That means, the columns are under crushing and buckling stress. So, for buckling and crushing how to calculate the strength of the column that we have discussed here. In next class, we will discuss the same thing to design the column, how the design can be started 
we'll discuss in next class